So this is the most interesting part of this article. Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission released a rule book for the crypto industry last year, stating that retail investors can start trading crypto from June 1st. What? Bankless Nation, it is the first Friday of June. What time is it, David? Uh, Ryan, it's the Bankless Friday weekly roll-up where we cover the entire weekly news in crypto, which is always an ambitious endeavor. There is so much to cover this week, which is why I'm talking so fast. I'm also, it's the morning time for me now for the first time in two months. So I'm Welcome extra back. caffeinated. Welcome I back to the coffee. East Coast. Yeah, yeah. it's great. Well, it's, it's great it's to empty, have you. Actually. It's good to see that background again, David. Mm -hmm. I, I, mm -hmm. I missed it. We're seeing kind of a you know a different background for the last mm -hmm. week. I missed those bricks. Yeah, the, no, the, the brick and the lighting and the good camera, it's all back. Everything's Do you know, it's, it's June. And mm -hmm. um, last year, 16 days from now, Three Arrows Capital went bust. It's when we first oh, found out about really? it. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, this is a Three Arrows Capital Month. Last this month is was around. Terra, Terra Month, and this yep. month is Three Arrows Capital Month. Man. Yep. Man. It, time flies, right? When you're having yeah. fun. Yeah. Are we having fun? Little did we know, we still had FTX ahead of us at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, okay, well, that means that it's been roughly one year since Ether bottomed. It's been one year since the Ether bottom in that case. That's true. Yeah. About one year since the Ether yeah. bottom. We're going to talk about that then. Also, a few topics of the week. Did China just do a 180 on yeah. crypto? Did yeah. They did reverse you, did you read about this? I just started to, and I want to get your take on it, but I feel like no one is talking about it, and uh -huh. we're going to talk about it. Uh, what else we got to cover? We got this Celsius end game. So if you are a Celsius creditor or you're interested about the state of Celsius creditors, hi, Ryan, uh, <laughs> you're going to be find out exactly how much money you're going to get. And if you are over $5,000 of a Celsius creditor, you're going to get something else. <laughs> I'm prepared to be disappointed. Yeah. yeah, definitely hold your breath on that one. Uh, WorldCoin raising $110 million, 115 uh, divides the crypto industry, continues to be polarizing. And then also the secret to winning the bear market. We got to take from Kobe at the end here. All right. Uh, before we get in, David, we've got a special word from our friends and sponsors. Do you want to add some more excitement to your life? <laughs> your staking life, that is? Mm -hmm. You can add excitement to the staking routine of ETH using the Asymmetrics protocol. What is this thing, David? So for those that are familiar with Pool Together, Asymmetrics is like Pool Together, but for ETH staking. Uh, and so you stake your Ether, and then instead of giving a just boring 4.55%, you get anywhere between zero... <laughs> And a thousand percent, <laughs> and it, it could be anyone. Probably going to be zero. Might be a thousand percent. And so this is what we call a prize-linked savings account. Uh, and so all of the yield gets pulled up, and then one lucky winner gets everyone's yield, and every, everyone else gets zero, uh, zero percent yield. Uh, and so if you would like to add a little excitement to your ETH staking, Asymmetrics is for you. Uh, Bankless.cc/slash. Asymmetrics. Uh, you also can follow them on Twitter, asymmetrics underscore ETH on Twitter. Look at this. Look at this. Almost seven ETH that you could just right. get right daily on the daily right now. Mm -hmm. That's the current reward pool. Uh, kind of fun, right? Yeah. Uh, so only two hundred and thirty-four users are competing for that seven ETH. Huh. Um, so like this actually. So the, I believe there's also like an extra little uh, incentive. Uh, so you actually technically get more yield uh, if you like net everything out with asymmetrics. Um, you just have to be ready to get zero percent for a while. Or maybe a thousand. <laughs> you, you don't know until you, you try. Don't know. <laughs> yeah, you can try your luck here. Okay, let's get to the markets though. Um, Bitcoin price, what are we at on the week? Uh, call it a flat week, up half a percent on the week. Started at 26,700, ending at 26,900. All right, how about yeah. Ether? Uh, actually up 2.5%. So Ether is up on the week. Started at 1820, uh, we are up to 1865. And the ratio, ETH oh, we Bitcoin. Actually, we actually got pretty high up on Ether uh, this Did last we? week. Oh, yeah, Should we, we talk we, about that? Yeah, What's this spike? What's this green candle here? Yeah, uh, this, when was I, that? I think that was when the um, uh, the debt ceiling got raised. Uh, ah, so the 29th. We, yeah, so <laughs> coupled to trad markets. Um, but still, uh, slowly positive, optimistic trajectory lately on Ether, 2.5%. Uh, uh, Ether BTC ratio looking really good if you are directionally long Ether, uh, like I am. Uh, at 0 0.0692. So wow, happy happy ratio. That's you know, a pretty big ratio a, gain in the month the of May. Look at this. The ratio is up only in May. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Like I'm I'm zooming out on the by the way on the Kraken Pro charts, which lets you do this. Uh, very nice. I can see the ratio yeah. over time. Uh, -huh. uh yes. Yeah, okay. So we're back around the the April. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like mid April. But but you're yeah. right. After a, a dip, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, at the end of April, where we've been up. 
up only in May for the ratio. Up so uh, go go ETH. Total um, crypto market cap one point one seven trillion dollars. Pretty flat. Pretty flat. David, flat. give us some stablecoin numbers too. Uh, um, down, Ryan. <laughs> down. Stable on stablecoin numbers. Okay, so twelve months change in stablecoin supply. Uh, it's bad. One hundred sixty-two billion down to a hundred twenty-six billion uh, year-to-date change since twenty twenty-three. One hundred thirty-nine. The total billion. amount of uh, stable coins mm -hmm. that have been issued. So it's like yes. kind of market cap of stable coins, which, which is right. a great usage metric for stable mm -hmm. coins. Yeah. So the, the, the stable coin supply in crypto is our liquidity. Uh, right. so it's, it's a very base nice. It's important to see where stable coins are going. Seeing them go down is bad because that means there is less liquidity in the system. Interestingly though, tether is at a all time high. Uh, so Tether, the 12 month, uh, the year to date of Tether uh, started at $70 billion, is currently at $83 billion, surpassing its all time high. Uh, 12 months ago, it was at $83 billion. Then Three Rose Capital got liquidated and started to trend downwards. But now Tether has resumed all time high. So uh, for a while, USDC was looking real good against Tether, gaining a lot of market share. Um, lately, ever since uh, a year ago, and especially after um, the banking crisis, USDC is had some, some headwinds and Tether has gotten some tailwinds. Look at this chart. So I have a take on this. You know, last bear market, stablecoin supply actually grew a bunch. So, so look at this. Much. This is just, this is My Tether. My God, that is gargantuan. Yeah, 2019 versus 2021. In fact, it grew primarily 20, okay, during so looking the bear at 2020, market. We were at like $5 billion of Tether supply. Yeah. 2020. Fast forward to 2022, uh, touching 85 billion. Right. That so is that's some been growth. Up. But you know what's interesting is um, why this decrease. One explanation for this is uh, T bills, treasuries are actually right. the best yield yeah. farm out there right now, and that is outside of um, DeFi. Right. It, it in the last bear market, with interest rates, Fed interest rates at zero percent or close to zero percent, very low. Let's just say DeFi uh, interest offer right. the best yeah. yield on your dollar is no longer the case. Although, um, here's a take, Maker is trying. Mm -hmm. uh, the Maker DAO is mulling a proposal to boost the die savings rate to 3.3%. God, when's Remind the last you, time you heard the die savings rate? <sighs> it's been a while. Probably 2020. Mm -hmm. I haven't even thought about it since 2020. Um, I used and, to consider the die savings rate as like the binary star system between e the ETH stake rate and the die savings rate. This is when DAI was like the only meaningfully uh, like decentralized stable coin on Ethereum. Um, uh, and then it's been at zero for a very long time or at 1% yep. as of recently. But this is this is 3.3% uh, is not small. That's a decent chunk of MakerDAO uh, revenue going into the DAI savings rate. Uh, yeah, implied that will increase the supply of DAI in the market. That's that, that's the aim. And by the way, making them more competitive with basically T-bills with treasuries mm -hmm. out there, mm -hmm. which are about 5%, something like this. So mm -hmm. uh, crypto creeping up there. It's a nice equilibrium. Let's talk about ETH staking though. Uh, what is this chart from Hildabi? Yeah, this is crazy. Okay, 17.4% of all staked Ether was deposited last month, in the month of May. Wow. That is significant. 17.4% of, of the total all, ETH staked yes. happened in, in May. Including the deposit queue, which is a one-way queue into the beacon chain. That's crazy. Yes. I yes. mean, this is um, much more than I thought. Yes. Yeah, the same, in the same way this, this kind of feels like at post EIP 1559, it was burn, it ended up burning way more ether than people thought. Yeah. Same thing's happening with staking. It's like, man, people are staking way more than we thought that they would. A anytime you say um, ETH burn rate, you know, I got to open up ultrasound money. Just it's, it's been uh, at least two weeks since we've opened up ultrasound money. We'll oh, do for man, it. look at this. Look at yeah, this. Down this only. is beautiful. Down, down only oh, ETH supply. We ne are uh, negative 275,000 ether since the merge. Damn. There you Win go. one million. Win one million. Uh, tell me about the Ethereum yeah. validator queue, though. It's uh, an interesting story. Speaking of all-time highs, the wait to be on the beacon chain for a validator is at all-time high. Thirty-eight days. So if you deposit thirty-two ether, you got to wait thirty-eight days. The world's most staking. popular club. <laughs> you can't get in. You got to wait thirty-eight days. Everyone uh, wants to get in. The exit time is uh, zero minutes. Zero you, minutes. You are free, you are free to leave <laughs> anytime. <laughs> Uh, it was happy hour in there, so you yeah. know everyone's uh -huh. trying to get in. Uh, total MEV distributed to validators. Here's an interesting stat on its own: um, 200k ETH distributed to validators of MEV. What does this tell us? Uh, so MEV, uh, this also includes tips. So in, in just anything above base fee is what we're looking at. So 200,000 Ether was distributed to Ether stakers cumulatively total since um, proof of stake has launched. So Ether stakers have received have so spenders have been sent 200,000 ether to savers. 
This is why Ether is great savings technology. And this is a meme <laughs> I am just technology. ripping from the hands of Bitcoiners who say BTC is great savings technology. Yeah. Staked Ether is the best savings technology of all time. And th what, what we're seeing here is we're seeing spenders, short people with short time pre preferences, giving their time preference to people with long-term time preferences, the ETH stakers. See, d guys, what you don't know about David is he is actually a hardcore Bitcoiner. Yeah. He just substitutes the word Bitcoin for Ether, yes. and it's the and same it, it, exact and it thing. Will make, except it works <laughs> way better. Dude, Bitcoiners have always been right, except they just chose the wrong thing. <laughs> All right. Um, for the bankless maximalists out there, though, of which both Hello. you and I consider ourselves, we uh -huh. want maximally bankless things. This was a great headline and story coming out of Decrypt this week. Ethereum and Bitcoin balances on exchange edge towards a five-year low. What? Wow. So take a look at this. Wow. Uh, the amount for Ether, anyway, um, there's now 18 million ETH ether on exchanges that represents 15 percent did you know though in the summer of 2020 it was 30 nice. percent so we have about half of the amount of eth on exchanges in custodial systems than we did in 2020 three years ago i love this that. is great this means more that. people are going bankless more mm -hmm. people are taking custody of their private keys and getting it off of custodial solutions very very bullish on this metric so we, we should ask why why is this happening what what's going on here why are so many people going bankless uh so i mean the first uh this this trend definitely started with post ftx uh, even so like everyone who's been on a, a centralized exchange has been like you know i'm going to try out that self-custody thing so even there's been outflows of free ETH from even all the good exchanges like Coinbase and Kraken, right? So that's going into people's self-custody however they want to do that. Um, there's also regulatory fears. And so uh, if the, the choke point is like, you know what, I'm, I don't want to get choked out. I'm going to do the self-custody thing first. Uh, and then also there's the beacon chain, which is sucking up all the ether, which requires self-custody, kind of, mostly, most of the time, some of the time. Uh, and so uh, interestingly enough, hardware wallet sales are also up only as well. Hmm. Uh, and so there's just all of this demand. And also at the same time versus 2020 DeFi as like a utility is way better than it's ever been like the utility of being bankless is up uh, so as the industry has developed the reasons to self-custody has also increased another one of the most bullish things going on that yeah. no one's talking about yeah. because it's a bear market and we don't like good news except yeah. we do on bankless <laughs> i'm always down for some good news uh cyrus unessi had mm -hmm. a really good take i think mm -hmm. on the current state of the nft market why don't yeah. you give us the tldr the NFT market is garbage and going to zero and retail hates JPEGs and crypto Twitter hates all coins with pictures. He's, <laughs> he's, he's being hyperbolic here. Uh, here. And then he follows up and says, uh, here are a few reasons why I haven't dumped my NFTs because of this. First, I still like my JPEGs more than I liked ever liked true altcoins. The art is worth more to me than looking at XRP or IOTA balance on a block explorer. Uh, he's just picking out like shit coins, basically uh, picking on them. Uh, the market caps of these NFTs are extremely tiny now. A one ETH floor translates to a $20 million market cap. That depends, of course, on the supply of the NFT. But generally speaking, um, uh, the 10,000 PFP uh, is like kind of the standard. Even at the depths of the 2019 bear market, giant scams still maintained higher market caps than this. $20 million market cap is insanely small. NFTs are structurally underinvested in because people don't understand them yet. Blue chips like punks and apes are sitting at a $1 billion market cap. Which $1 billion coins have more staying power and brain value and utility and fundamentals than punks? I'll wait. Memes are still extremely popular. People have quit buying them, but they can't quit talking about them. There's something about JPEGs that gnaws at you. They don't disappear the way Nia, Neo, IOTA, and AVAX did. Can it really go down another 90% from here? Don't answer that. <laughs> I'm fairly certain someone will come <laughs> along and buy this stuff soon. Why? Because mixing gambling and art is a new cultural phenomenon. I think it's this. I think it's a great series, like line, line of, of of thought. Like I think don't don't overthink NFTs. They were the a big bubble, and they were this first big bubble. And like just like let's 
be like stupid simple Isn't here. Isn't he just saying basically NFTs are better meme coins than meme coins? Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah. There you uh -huh. go. That's what it is. And they're, they're going to pump again for the same reason they pumped in the first time. And I think like low, like illiquid, low cap NFTs are like a great place to place your bets in this bear uh, market. The, I think one, one thing I see Cyrus is saying though is the blue chip ones in particular. Those are the ones that are kind sure. of like surviving, right? And there's definitely going to be some up and comers, mm -hmm. but definitely there's going to be the vast majority of NFTs that are going to go to zero mm -hmm. or close to zero, right? Yes. Yeah. I think the, the, the game is to pick your bets, pick your place your chips as to which ones you think are, are underpriced, low, low priced, but still being like circulating around on crypto Twitter. You're betting on culture, aren't you? Yeah. You just make these cultural bets. Cough MFers. <laughs> <laughs> Stop shilling your bag, sir. I, I don't even know. I, I might own an MFer. Yes, yeah, I you do. Have, you Did have I? one. Yeah, you yeah, have one. You convinced yeah. me to buy one. Yeah. Uh -huh. God only knows what that um, that's priced at right now. I'm sure well, it's about close one to zero. ETH. About one ETH? ETH? All right. Yeah, yeah. See, it's not at zero. So like, no, it's no, no. That's at not zero. too bad. Yeah. That's about what I bought it for, I think. Something mm -hmm. like this. Uh, all right, David, we've got some stuff coming up. What do we have coming up? Coming up next, we're going to talk about China's potential 180 on crypto, which might be the most bullish news I've ever heard ever and no one's talking about it are people not talking about it for good reason or not we don't really know uh the celsius deal gets inked so what you need to know especially as a celsius creditor and then also is this the darkest winter cryptos ever had we discuss but first i want to talk about these fantastic sponsors that make the show possible especially kraken our preferred exchange for 2023 if you have not tried out kraken or all of the beautiful charts that we talk about every single weekly roll up go try it out Right now. Kraken Pro has easily become the best crypto trading platform in the industry. The place I use to check the charts and the crypto prices, even when I'm not looking to place a trade. On Kraken Pro, you'll have access to advanced charting tools, real-time market data, and lightning-fast trade execution, all inside their spiffy new modular interface. Kraken's new customizable modular layout lets you tailor your trading experience to suit your needs. Pick and choose your favorite modules and place them anywhere you want in your screen. With Kraken Pro, you have that power. Whether you are a seasoned pro or just starting out, join thousands of traders who trust Kraken Pro for their crypto trading needs. Visit pro.kraken.com to get started today. Introducing ETHX from Stater. ETHX is a liquid staking token designed to maximize rewards, all while securing Ethereum. With Stater, you can run an Ethereum node with just four ETH, an 85% lower capital requirement versus the 32 ETH required for solo staking. With Stater's four ETH nodes, you can get a 35% average higher yield, since you charge fees to those who use your node to stake their ETH. By running a node with Stater, the ETHX staking derivative token can get minted on your validators and can flow into the world of DeFi, which Stater is actively building integrations and partnerships into to increase the utility of ETHX. Stater allows for both permissioned and permissionless nodes to join the network, maximizing its potential scalability for ETHX while preserving the values of decentralization and openness behind its liquid staking token. Go to staterlabs.com ETH and sign up to get access to the Stater staking protocol. Is China warming up to crypto? That is the question right now. Here's a headline. Beijing releases white paper for Web3 innovation and development. This is coming straight from Beijing. A, a Web3 innovation and development white paper? We're not seeing these kinds of white papers being right. written by the, uh, the White House these days. Tell us what's going on. So this white paper, which uh, I'm trying to figure out the significance of the Beijing Municipal Science and Technology Commission, which released this white paper. Um, I'm not a China expert at all. Uh, so I have no idea how this institution scales in the world of like authorities in China. Anyways, the document states that Web3 technology is an inevitable trend for future internet and industry development. Uh, the commission aims to construct Beijing as a global innovation hub for the digital economy. Uh, to hmm. that end, Beijing's Chaoyang district will spend at least 100 million yuan, $14 million every single year until 2025. Not that much money, but still it's uh, more than zero. Uh, this got on CZ's radar, who gave a take. Interesting timing on this Web3 white paper, he says. Not sure of the authenticity. Lots of talks about NFTs, VR, AI, Metaverse, etc. Looks like ByteDance, JD, and Baidu each have their sections. Gavin Wood and Beeple were mentioned. Web3, Web3, Web3. Beeple was mentioned? Place. Yeah. Gavin right? Wood? Yeah. Look, someone so here, actually printed this out, too. It's mm -hmm. an actual printout of the white paper in yeah. paper form. Imagine that. <laughs> Uh, and so this is the most interesting part of this article, this white paper. To me, Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission released a rule book for the crypto industry last year, stating that retail investors can start trading crypto from June 1st. What? Okay, first, wait, wait. Hon can Hong you Kong. That? Hong, Hong this, Kong. Is, this is Hong Kong, not China, okay. which is an important difference. Okay. Although, 
Valence, uh, strong although valence. is it an important difference? Yes, I yes, yes. no. It, it almost seems like, seems like the experimental zone for yes. the rest of China, yeah. the yes. financial experimental zone. But but go on. This is the Securities and Futures Commission. So is that like the equivalent of the if the SE SEC and CFTC combined, that's what in, this would inside be Inside of Hong Kong, yeah. Okay, uh-huh. go ahead. Stated that retail investors can start trading crypto from June 1. So first off, congrats for, to Hong Kong for getting rules. Really happy for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, if, if, it was, if this was mainland China, this would be massive. Uh, Hong mm. Kong's a great uh, pigeonhole, great foothold, great mm-hmm. uh, beachhead for the rest of China, but retail investors can start trading crypto. Wow, I, well, that's just fantastic. This is great. This is, uh, there was also a um, segment, I guess, on uh, TV in China. Mm-hmm. So from the China Central Television, um, CZ called the Chinese community buzzing mm-hmm. after Bitcoin was seen on TV in a segment. And of course, this is um, pretty uh, tightly controlled state yes. media. So right. very intentional mm-hmm. to choose to show Bitcoin or not. And this is a uh, buy Bitcoin, withdraw cash, redeem. Yeah. Um, I don't know, again, what all of this means, David. It's it's difficult to parse, but yes. it's, there seems to be a, a warming to crypto um, in, we're, we're, in China. We that's, in that's... the West are still trying to figure this out okay. because yes. we, don't, we don't know how big of a deal this agency is. Um, the segment that you're talking about is actually taken down, so it's taken down ah, retro- retrospectively. Okay. Well, that's not um, great. So others have said, Wu Blockchain, his, his tweets, uh, this is an unimportant government department in Beijing uh, and it is just exa- deliberately exaggerating emotions. Uh, it focuses on the AI and metaverse, while the Chinese government is nothing supportive of, of crypto. Uh, so some people are saying it's a nothing burger. Uh, I am in a couple chats asking some Chinese friends and other people's opinions about like, yo, what's the deal here? Like, how legit is this? And there is contention. No one, no one can come to consensus on this. Oh, really? It's, mm-hmm. Some people are saying, hey, it's a big deal. Others are saying yeah. it's not a big deal at all. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's kind of the question. I, yeah. I guess maybe that's the the, the measured take. Mm-hmm. But um, China really, I, I think, is has been an enigma on crypto. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so very difficult to um, to discern. But right. I guess one take on this is, I think whenever you see, you know, so China and the U.S. of course are economic rivals, rivals in many different ways. It seems like increasingly, if um, China, if if the U.S. goes hard on like banning crypto, negative on crypto, I, I think China will right. in turn support crypto. Right. Like if the US zigs, China's gonna zag. Take, take like, the other opposite end forth. of the stick, yeah. Uh-huh. Right, which is probably long-term bullish. Good for crypto. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, on the back of this, even in Hong Kong, I don't see <laughs> like a whole bunch of crypto projects being like, all right, cool, Hong Kong, we're moving to Hong Kong, let's do it, right? right? And so until I see that um, sort of skin in the game and stake, I think the market will be pretty undecided as to whether China is actually warming to crypto or whether this is just a mm-hmm. yeah, flash in the pan. And the, the thing is, right. I feel like China has changed its mind on crypto so That's many different thing. times. So like if they... China came in and said, we are so bullish on crypto, like we're mm-hmm. going to allow everyone to do anything. And that would be really <laughs> bullish for a moment. And then they could completely change their mind as they have already done t- five times over uh, the next year. And so like, even if we got the most bullish news possible out of China, like no one would be like, okay, but are you serious though? Because like, right. we don't really know. So mixed review on this news, but probably more positive than than certainly negative, yes. right? D- it, trending in the right direction. Worst case, yeah. it's a nothing burger, but there could yeah. be something here. Uh, yeah. Tell me about it's the not, end game. It, that is correct. That it is not bearish. <laughs> <laughs> if there's anything we know, it is not bearish. There we go. Uh, tell me about the end game for Celsius, though, David. You promised. Am I, I, I going to get any, yeah. <laughs> any okay, so ETH out of this account? Are, are you ready for this headline, Ryan? Uh, I don't know. I'll brace myself. Fahrenheit wins bid to acquire assets of insolvent <laughs> Wait, crypto lenders. <laughs> Celsius. Are AIs writing these uh, <laughs> CoinDesk articles now? <laughs> Crypto consortium Fahrenheit has won a bid to acquire the insolvent lender Celsius Network, whose assets were previously valued at around $2 billion. Oh, okay. I thought they got this wrong. I thought they no. uh, converted Celsius to Fahrenheit. No. But Fahrenheit is the is winner it, of is the bid. A Crypto consortium called Fahrenheit has <laughs> okay. purchased Celsius. Yeah, well, so my apologies, Freedom CoinDesk. Units taking the, taking the victory here. Uh, okay, okay, so the, the group will acquire Celsius institutional loan portfolio, staked cryptocurrencies, mining unit, and additional alternative investments. Um, so the plan proposes that all of Celsius assets, except liquid cryptocurrencies, will be transferred to a newly formed company, Nuco. Uh, and so here, here's the here's the deal. 
Here's the deal. Are you ready for Ryan? Here's yeah, what, I'm here's ready. what you're going to get. Do I get anything? If your Celsius bag is more than $5,000, you will get a small distribution and become a shareholder in this new company, which is going to have um, some private equity, uh, some mining assets, et cetera. It's a little um, bit more. It's a little bit more than 5K. So that's what I get, huh? Oh, yes. Yeah, yes, perhaps. Okay. Uh, and so uh, what, what does Celsius currently have to give uh, all these new shareholders of this new company? Mm -hmm. um, they have some DeFi crypto assets. Uh, they have some. They have a loan book, loan book portfolio, uh, PE and VC investments, uh, liquid cryptocurrency, about five hundred million dollars, and also mining assets because Celsius wanted to buy Bitcoin miners because they thought that was a good thing to do with the money. <laughs> Uh, so this new pro this new plan proposes that all of these, except the liquid crypto assets, will go into a newly formed company, Nuco. 100% of the equity in this new company will go to the creditors that are owed more than $5,000 pro rata. Those owed less than $5,000 will get 70 cents on the dollar so that's the on key. their claims and if no are, equity. If you are a Celsius holder, it's a totally different deal if you have 5,000 or less. If you have yes. less or less than 5,000, I should say, uh -huh. then you just get 70%. Right. So you get a 30% haircut and you get 70% and no equity. If uh -huh. you have more than $5,000, you get this new co equity. You which... know, so if they're, if they're, depending on how they're marking this, like $5,000, say you have Ether in, in Celsius and yeah. Celsius goes insolvent, that Ether was priced higher. Yeah. So like 70 percent on your dollar for a force hold of Ether oh, for that amount of time. I didn't might think actually about that. Put, like play out if it's marked to market at the time. If it's time, marked to market, which yeah. I if think it I don't know how is. they're. I don't know how they're doing that. Huh. I don't know yeah, I don't know that. that that detail. Mm -hmm. That'd be a good question. Seventy percent on the dollar for the claims and no mm -hmm. equity. Yeah, it depends on what the value of the Ether was at the time. Certainly. Yeah. Okay, so um, if you are a creditor above five thousand dollars, you should not expect to see much returns after you get all the deductions. So you you get the distribution of the liquid crypto assets that is left after they pay out the sub five thousand people. Any share of the monies that uh, Celsius gets from suing Mashinsky, so that's fun. Uh, and then you also get the share of this new company equity. You are Mashinsky not getting. Mashinsky has no money. Come on, you're not going to get he, anything. No, he cashed out a lot of money. Oh, really? He cashed out hundreds of millions, him and his oh, wife. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, along with all the other uh, well, let's executives. Let's get that back. Yes, yeah, big clawbacks. All right. Big clawbacks. All right. uh, I mean, I don't know how much that's going to translate. It's revenge equity, then. Revenge I'll take equity, some of that. yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so there are new managers and investors also that need to be paid. So $35 million per year salary to be paid to the management team of this new company. So who are these guys? That's my big question. Well, it's the, it's the Fahrenheit holder. team. The Fahrenheit team. They will be, be, who will be putting $50 million of their own money to buy the shares of this new company. Uh, their equity is subjected to a two-year lockup that they can sell up to 30% of their equity after one year if Celsius equity trades at 150% of net, net asset value. Uh, after one year, the Fahrenheit team has the option to dump on you if Celsius equity tokens increase in value. Uh, oh so they can God. the Fahrenheit can sell in one year if uh, the value of this new equity token goes up by 50%. What are they going to do? What's their business? Are they going to uh, take in I mean, more? It's like private equity, right? They're just going to take it, reshuffle it, try and rebuild it. Um, I don't know. What do you the rebuild? same thing was going on with FTX 2.0 right now. It's like they're also trying to restart that exchange. Yeah, I, I'm not I'm not bullish on this equity. Um, I'd rather get 70% of my money back right now Sorry, rather than have bro. this. I take it you had more than $5,000 in Celsius. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not much more, but like, yeah. Yeah. So I'm not I don't love this, I, but I don't know the new managers. Um, uh, Schmalik Sh 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 hey, well, Schmaminsky the is going to be the <laughs> manager. <laughs> I mean, if there are anything like the old managers, like, right. come on. Right. <laughs> this right. doesn't help. Well, hey, if you, if you have enough money to buy a company like this to make a bid in this state in the market, you got to yeah. be doing something not terrible. But that that's hopeful. Fahrenheit. All right. So we're Fahrenheit. Freedom outside units. of the... the Freedom yeah. units. Is that what they're called? Freedom units? For, yeah, Fahrenheit. Yeah. Oh my God, you're t you're making a joke about the Fahrenheit yes. system rather than the metric yeah, yeah. system. All exactly. right. Exactly. Yeah. I thought that was the token. They're called yeah. like freedom uh -huh. units. It wouldn't surprise me. All right, David. Well, let's move on from Celsius. I want to leave that in the in the distant past here. Um, I want to talk about where we are today in yeah. the crypto market right now, and this is a question for the OGs. Is this crypto winter darker than the last? Um, what inspired this question for me was uh, I saw this tweet from Icebergy, mm -hmm. uh, who said, every chat I'm in is super depressed about the current state of crypto. I don't know what chats this individual is in. Uh, they look like kind of a, a dev angel investor focused on crypto NFTs and Bitcoin. So probably yeah. a crypto trader type, but yeah. definitely follows type. price as closely as, as, yeah. as we do. So that kind of begged the question to me, 
is this crypto winter darker than the last one? And I put out a question to the OGs. I got a bunch of fantastic responses. Maybe I'll, I'll read a couple and then I'll, um, I'll get your way in. So uh, Dan McArdle says, no, not at all. In 2011, and by the way, Dan's been through about all of these. Uh, in 2011, negative 94%, he's talking about, I think he's talking about Bitcoin price primarily, yeah, so right. not full crypto market cap. So 2011 was negative 94%, was easy to fear. It was done for decades. Crypto was done for decades. 2015, we got a negative 87%. That was the bear market there. 2019, negative 84%. That was the last one, but digital gold had caught on. The beginnings of DeFi were apparent. 2023, we're only down 78%. Centralized stuff failed, oh well. Every other bear market was worse. So Dan's take was every other bear market was worse, and he brought some data points. Objectively, rather than 2011, negative 94%, 2019, negative 84%, Bitcoin at least, is only negative 8%. Uh, so that's a take. Uh, Brantley.eth says, not even close. Crypto is an order of magnitude bigger, more developed, better funded now, and has a far lower chance of total failure at this point. DC Investor says, no, because we are not dealing with existential crisis. But we got big enough this time where mainstream questions the value prop like the natives last time. A lot of responses to this. Mm -hmm. I, from what I could tell, most of the OGs, here's, here's Anthony Sassano, says, not even close. Last bear market, people were questioning if crypto would even survive. This bear market, there's more genuine uh, actual long-term focus building going on than I've ever seen before. Most of the OGs are, are saying, no, it's not worse. Uh, do you concur? What's your take on this question? I think there's two sides of this conversation. I think almost by definition, OGs who have seen two bull markets, so that's, that's you, that's me, that's Cezano, that's a number of these people here. By definition, like it's not as bad for them because A, one, they've done it before and B, they bought in at like 10X lower prices to begin with. So for them specifically, it's not as bad because they're just in a little bit more of a cushy position. I think the first, everyone's first bear market uh, feels the same. <laughs> stresses them out in unique and different and unique ways. And yeah. it, and that is always going to be the same. Everyone's mm. first bear market, they are going to their conviction is going to be tested. Uh, last bear market, we had certain challenges that we do not have this time. And this bear market, we have new challenges that we did not have last time. Last time, Ethereum funding was about to go to zero and you were about to like have to pause development to figure that out, right? We were literally, and we legitimately had no use cases on the app layer. Like why, why Ethereum inspired me in 2017 to 2018, I can't remember. It was just like the vision. <laughs> I, I guess <laughs> I was around, yeah, the hope for that it could be something. Um, we did not have the re regulatory oversight and uh, like Gary Gensler and Choke Point 2.0. So that is the new challenge. And that is what these current, um, people who are going through this bear market are questioning themselves about, not about like what's the utility, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so, yes, every single bear market is, is the stress from every single bear market for every single new cycler is always valid and, and unique. And I would also agree that yes, these challenges are uh, different and perhaps easier, but they are still extremely like tough challenges. So I'm, I'm a little bit on, on both sides. What's kind of interesting is um, this is sort of almost a bear market defined by a negative regulatory reaction, negative nation state reaction to crypto. And that just means we're there. Like we're at the end of the level. This is round one of the boss fight, right? And like, we're fighting the final boss. This won't be the only battle. I think the final boss will take multiple forms, but like, that's how far we've actually come. And if you had told me in 2019 that the 2023 bear market um, would go down to just less than a trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, bear market. <laughs> Wait, what? But yeah, but that's but that's because you're. That's just because of when you got in, though. It's yes. just like the the where your disposition as a result of the place that you started in the crypto industry. I'm just. I guess what I'm saying is, objectively, at one trillion dollars, right. we got some punch. Yes. There's something here yes. in crypto, yeah. uh -huh. and that means something. But I totally acknowledge that everyone's bear market probably feels just about the same. So yeah. if this is your first time, it probably feels like the first time comparably right. to an OG. But that's why I do think OGs can kind of take the perspective a little bit. They mm -hmm. have a valuable perspective in that they can say objectively, rather than my own feelings, uh, objectively, is this a harder bear market than, than previous? And um, they're saying anyway, 
it's uh it's not worse than the last one right the threat of crypto not coming back is completely gone in my mind and that is the big difference David, what do we have coming up next? Coming up next, Blend. Blur's new NFT lending platform is putting in numbers. We got the WorldCoin race to talk about USDC natively on Arbitrum. We got some uh, MoonPay executives pocketing $150 million before shuttering the company. Oof. And so much more to talk about. But first, a moment to talk about these fantastic sponsors, especially MetaMask and MetaMask Learn, to learn about all of the crazy crypto jargon that Ryan and I sometimes use without explaining ourselves. Uh, so if we do that, sorry. But also, MetaMask Learn has a product to learn all about that. So let's go hear from them right now. Learning about crypto is hard. Until now. Introducing MetaMask Learn, an open educational platform platform about crypto, Web3, self-custody, wallet management, and all the other topics needed to onboard people into this crazy world of crypto. MetaMask Learn is an interactive platform with each lesson offering a simulation for the task at hand, giving you actual practical experience for navigating Web3. The purpose of MetaMask Learn is to teach people the basics of self-custody and wallet security in a safe environment. And while MetaMask Learn always takes the time to define Web3 specific vocabulary, it is still a jargon-free experience for the crypto curious user. Friendly, not scary. MetaMask Learn is available in 10 languages with more to be added soon, and it's meant to cater to a global Web3 audience. So are you tired of having to explain crypto concepts to your friends? Go to learn.metamask.io and add MetaMask Learn to your guides to get onboarded into the world of Web3. Mantle is a brand new high-performance Ethereum Layer 2 network built differently from the other Layer 2s you may be familiar with. Mantle is a modular Layer 2 built on the OP stack but uses Eigenlayer's data availability solution instead of the expensive Ethereum Layer 1. Not only does this reduce Mantle's gas fees by 80% compared to other Layer 2s, but it also reduces gas fee volatility. Mantle has a decentralized sequencer set, eliminating the risk of downtime and censorship on the network. And because Mantle implements multi-party computation nodes, layer one settlement execution is shortened from seven days to as low as just one or two. Mantle is the first layer two built by a DAO and is backed by one of the biggest DAO treasuries in the world, BitDAO. Mantle already has sub communities from around Web3 onboarded to help the growth of Mantle, like Game7 for Web3 gaming or EduDAO for the world of DeSide and Bybit for TVL liquidity and on-ramps. Check out Mantle at mantle.xyz and follow them on Twitter at 0xMantle. Blend, Blur's NFT lending platform, has put in some absolute numbers. Loan volumes of $308 million in the past 22 days. Why 22? Because it launched 22 days ago. So in addition to the NFT trading platform that we all know as Blur, uh, their Blend platform is doing something like 20 to 30% of the total platform's revenue. Um, so Azuki's uh, amassed 70,000 Ether in loan volume coming from 6,500 loans, uh, coming in at number one in the preferred NFT borrowing uh, collection on Blend. CryptoPunks coming in at 35,000 ETH in loan volume. Milady is coming in at 22,500. Uh, so we all knew that NFT Phi was a thing, but uh, Blend from Blur has just like dropped an absolute cannonball in the world of NFT finance. This has just exploded. So 82% of the NFT lending market. Can you just mm -hmm. explain what is an NFT loan, David? Yeah, so you put up your NFT as collateral and then you loan some money. From you take that. it to the pawn shop, basically. Yep. 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 Take the pawn shop. And you pay you, and you pay you back your your ether or your USDC. I'm assuming this is all ether, uh, and then you get your NFT back, or you don't, and you get liquidated, and somebody buys your NFT as a it's like a put on the NFT. Wow. Um, so this is could cause some tears if NFTs yes. uh, go up again, and and somebody you know pawned it off and sold the bottom uh, effectively. Uh, mm -hmm. That's very interesting, though. It's good to see NFT Fi taking off. Tell me about the Coinbase wallet, David. Yeah, so Coinbase Wallet has introduced gas-free USDC transactions uh, on Polygon. Uh, so you can send USDC on Polygon using the Coinbase Wallet for free. Coinbase will cover your gas fees. I was wondering what the mechanism behind this, and so this is actually using EIP three zero zero nine, which is a account in the account abstraction um, category. So it's using this EIP three zero zero nine transfer with authorization. Uh, it's a meta transaction, which is again part of the whole account abstraction thing. Uh, and so Coinbase just relays the transaction, pays the Matic gas fee, and you get free USCC transfers on Polygon. I think like this is a cool marginal improvement for a narrow use case, which is USCC in Coinbase mm -hmm. Wallet on Polygon. But I think why this is a big deal is that it extrapolates very, very well. Uh, as soon as EIP um, uh, 4844 comes, dank sharding and gas fees on layer twos come, there's going to be a fight for consumers, for wallet users, for transactors on chain. And it's going to come to like, I bet you 
most transactions on chain from retail users end up being free because someone's going to subsidize that because that is a competitive advantage. They I'm, should be I'm free. I'm predicting uh, this with this information. I'm, I'm a loosely held prediction. You, most transactions from retail end users are just going to be free on layer twos. Or free, or they might get paid. They might get paid. That's a different story. Volume. That's a different story. Well, this is really interesting because this is a key uh, element of UX. Imagine the, mm -hmm. the crypto experience right now. Imagine if in, you were to transfer money uh, from somebody in Venmo, you actually had to have like PayPal stock, a portion of right. PayPal stock to pay right. that fee to transfer. Like mm -hmm. that's a bad UX. And so yep. this is working on that problem here. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, uh, USDC is now natively on Arbitrum. Yep. As a, well, actually, not yet. Sorry, you gotta wait seven days. June eighth, it cool. will be natively on Arbitrum. So it's good news for layer twos as well. Um, David, what is going on here? MoonPay executives pocketed a hundred and fifty million dollar raised from Series A. Of course, this is the account. Uh, Web three is going just great from our oh, friend Molly that's White. Molly's account. Yeah, gotcha. of course it would be her. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Molly, how you doing? What's up, Molly? Um, okay, so what is the story here? What dastardly deed just went on in Web3 again? MoonPay Insiders CEO Ivan Soto Wright uh, and along with others uh, sold $150 million of their own equity in their Series A raise in 2021. So they uh, MoonPay raised $555 million at a $3.4 billion valuation. Uh, and then the founders cashed out $150 million of that right before a crypto crash. Not, huh. not a good look. Not great. Not, not I mean, a good look. VCs have some responsibility uh, in the kind of their documents and you know, raises to not let this happen to them. And because right. this, does, if you're an investor, this kind of thing does not feel good. If you just right. invested in a company and the founders are already exiting before they've seen it through. Right. Um, so I guess a little bit like shame on the VCs who al right. also did this too. Um, but also shame on like MoonPay, it, like it's just bad form to do this. Yeah, it's definitely a if it bleeds it leads type of headline. Um, maybe the VCs were okay with it for some particular reason. Yeah, maybe. But, but man, MoonPay was inside of one single bull market. Mm -hmm. As a founder, I would feel bad if I exited inside of the same bull market. I would. Right? Like I exit would in the next bull market. That's. After That's you, the social contract. After you get the thing done and it's really yeah. there and it's really built. Hey, uh, maybe they consider it done. Paradigm, uh, one of I think the most prestigious, one of the one of the better VC companies yeah. in crypto, I would say, is broadening its crypto only focus to areas including AI. So Paradigm mm -hmm. just caught the AI bug. Mm -hmm. That's the uh, the story here. All right, David, are they abandoning crypto? <laughs> is Paradigm <laughs> done with crypto? What's going on? Uh, so they have changed their bio on Twitter. They've also changed some of their website. So it used to be Paradigm backs disruptive crypto slash Web3 companies and protocols. And now it's Paradigm is a research driven technology investment firm. Hmm. Um, uh, the line, uh, there was a line, we believe crypto will define the next few decades was removed from the homepage, which now makes no mention of Web3 or blockchains. Uh, and so uh, the their comment from a source for the block, which which wrote an article about this, that this change doesn't mean the company is shying away from crypto, but rather highlighting its reach into adjacent areas such as AI. So Paradigm gets the AI bug, um, changes up their website. And like, why, why is this news? Because people are talking about it on crypto Twitter. They're like, uh, <laughs> Par Paradigm or now Grifters, they, they never were committed to crypto in the first place, blah, 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 blah. Uh, what's your take on this, Ryan? Uh, I don't think so. I'm look, VCs are going to go where the opportunities are for VCs. So, um, <laughs> look, if crypto is jealous about that, I, I, I don't really understand that take. Um, I guess I, I will say that there is an element where, um, a lot of investors though, in general, like the shine is worn off of crypto. Like mm. AI is the new hot thing uh, from an right. investor perspective. Right. Right. Um, and I think that there's some opportunity in that because when everyone else, like, the best time to actually be looking at AI was probably like 2021. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah, right yeah. before. Um, but everyone was focused on crypto. Yeah, I think it's kind of a a no story. Maybe crypto's feeling a little bitter about uh, being forgotten here. I think it's right. I think it's exactly that meme of the guy like looking over his shoulder and his girlfriend, the crypto girlfriend, is like, who are you looking at? And the paradigm's looking at, at AI. The, like, again, why are we talking about this take? Well, because uh, there was a decent number of people, decent number of people on crypto Twitter who were like up in arms about this. 
in my new in my mind this isn't news <laughs> y'all are just <laughs> bored <laughs> like, so people, why are we talking about this you know, we're talking about it because other people are talking about it last week uh, three weeks ago people were canceling bank list two weeks ago people were canceling ledger and now we're people are bored. canceling paradigm because they changed a oh bio. people are canceling paradigm over yeah this? this is like this is why this is news it's like people are trying to cancel paradigm it's like yeah and they're like no this is you dumb. betrayed us this is paradigm dumb. Paradigm has like a billion Paradigm dollars that they need to deploy. Crypto. In crypto, though, uh, there is news. It's layoff season. Um, Binance layoffs. They're calling this a pruning of non-performers. Um, and they have laid off apparently 20% of their workforce. I believe mm. that's correct. Um, they had 8,000 employees. Uh, oh, my as God. Almost, yeah, that's a lot, right? So 20% down. <laughs> um, also just noticed uh, this week, Nansen, analytics yeah. company, uh, great product they've built. They just laid off 30%. Mm -hmm. of their workforce so the ceo kind of wrote about this and uh, this was his take it's extremely difficult decision we announced a reduction of our team by 30 percent two reasons for this first we scaled up the team on the back of breakneck growth it's kind of a whiplash crypto was you know expanding so fast you felt like you needed to hire a ton and now you have to take that off um and this year has been brutal for crypto markets so i think um crypto Startups, crypto companies um, are taking an opportunity to sort of prune and to scale mm -hmm. back right now. And that's just the way things are in the in the bear market. Um, these companies aren't going anywhere. I'm very confident of that. Uh, they are just uh, taking some time to kind of prune. Um, Coinbase did this earlier in the year. Like um, Gemini did this. Kraken uh, all, did this last year. All the big year. companies have laid people off. And this is just a normal part of the, the market cycle. Like there, there is the layoff phase for, for every company. And, and really like... If you're not, if you are optimizing for growth and you are not laying people off in the bear market, you haven't picked the correct op optimization point. That's like, what Brian Armstrong straight told us yes. uh, with his policy yeah. that last uh, time we had him on the podcast. Like it's always, it's sad to see layoffs. It's like an unfortunate headline for the company. But like if you, if you, if you are not laying people off then you didn't hire enough in the bull market. So this is normal. Expand, contract, expand, contract. Yes. That's how things grow here. Yes. Uh, speaking of expansion, WorldCoin just getting ready to expand mightily, I think, here. Sam Altman and company raised $115 million for the WorldCoin project. What is the significance of this? Uh, well, the WorldCoin is is really putting rubber down onto pavement. Uh, and so they are just ramping up everything. I feel like they think that they are primed to take the next big steps as a company to scan more people's eyeballs, to get more orbs out into the world and actually um, go from kind of a monolith to more of a modular company, which is part of the whole like world Every coin. time you say that, scan people's eyeballs with an orb, it just it can't not sound like, dystopian. It is, <laughs> I'm it is, sorry. It is dystopian. It, it, the reason why I'm like uh, comfortable saying those words is because like I have accepted that uh, biometric scanning is a valid attempt to produce civil resistance. And once you accept that premise, you understand that there are, and then, then it's like, okay, well, what are you gonna scan? Fingerprints, um, what are you gonna scan? Your face, uh, well, you need to scan something. Uh, and the iris is the most civil resistant part of your body. So if you, if you accept these assumptions, then you get okay we're gonna have to scan everyone okay, but, 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 but think of this <laughs> I, I get that so technically this may be the right solution but think right. of this crypto bros want to go uh, on yes. you the, the optic the optics are terrible and that's uh, world and who problem. is it oh it's it's the maker it's, of chat gpt the most powerful <laughs> ai on the planet wants to oh, be a and, <laughs> the orb is this like chrome ball <laughs> that like all these world coin employees have a habit of like pulling out of their backpack yeah i mean it, there could be um you know all press is good press kind of thing like yeah this is very attention grabby uh right. in a way i just yes. wonder if it just you know segues itself off a cliff rather than actually uh works that's my big yeah. question right yeah, now yeah yeah, yeah. I, the, the actual if you're concerned about how the world coin project is going to work or not you should pay attention to how um people are trying to game it. And that is mm. definitely currently underway right now. People are trying to game WorldCoin because like the idea is, is of WorldCoin and part of what, what they're raising money for is that they make building the orb more permissionless and they also make scanning eyeballs also more permissionless. So you have like orb agents, God, agents. Uh, <laughs> agents of the orb. <laughs> or agents of the orb who are like not employed by WorldCoin who are incentivized to go scan people's eyeballs because the protocol pays them to do that. It's like a referral fee. I know this is so Damn. Copy, copy, dude. <laughs> this is not and, making but then me feel as better. soon as you incentivize that to happen, well, how are you going to get to 8 billion people? You have to do this in a permissionless incentive driven yeah. way. Yeah. And so like they, they pay you in WorldCoin to scan people's eyeballs as like a referral fee. And so 
then people are going to be like, okay, do I need to go scan individuals or can I game the system somehow? And so like people are trying to game the world coin uh, protocol and sit like Sybil attack it. And if it stand, if the world coin protocol stands up to those Sybil attackers who are paid to try to attack the, uh, hack the thing and it still works, you got to be bullish on the system. I'm sorry. I think it's it's purporting to solve a massive problem. That that is the yes. uh, the upside here is yes. right. It's like identity, um, some kind of a an on chain identity solution. Yeah. Um, but wow, the branding's think, not great. <laughs> one thing they have to really do is they have to get the privacy maximalists on their side. I think they yes. have to get the decentralized decentralization maximalists on their side because they're not going to get the the centralizers on their side. You know, the of, nation of state all level of wants the to vectors to hate world going. I think that one is actually the easiest to account for. What? Which one? Uh, privacy. Privacy. It's, pre it's pretty easy to not. Then they they have all of the like. Here's how we don't collect your data. That's all available and like all like generally I think accepted though, by you people. You have to I get people like who are respecting the privacy community to right. independently audit this. It can't yes. just be Worldcoin being like we I don't love, store it. I would love Zuko's take on Worldcoin. Zuko's privacy. take. Yeah, yeah, a few of the other you know privacy maximalists yeah. we've had on right. uh, Matt runners. from yeah. um, Hopkins. Remember we had him on yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. the podcast. I would love his yeah. take. Anyway. Uh, interesting. A lot of money. Big war chest mm -hmm. here and mm -hmm. some major investors coming in, including um, Blockchain Capital, A16Z, Bain Capital, etc. So mm -hmm. it's definitely a lot of uh, VC firepower here. Speaking of which, Magic just raised mm -hmm. $52 million to grow crypto wallet as a service used by corporate clients like Mattel and Macy's. Yeah, th these guys have been around for a while. Uh, they used to be called uh, Fortmatic Wallet, if you remember that way back oh, yeah. when. Yeah, okay. these are the That's same who these people. guys are. I actually okay. haven't heard about them in a very long time, uh, but I remember working with them uh, back back in my last startup as like, hey, we we need wallets for people who don't give a shit about crypto. Very practical, and very practical, practical approach. Yeah. Very, very similar easy. to Coinbase's um, wallet as a service uh, yeah, system yeah, yeah, yeah. that they built up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So congrats to the Magic people. You guys have been heads down building for a very long time. Very good project. David, what do we have coming up next? Coming up next, we got questions from the nation. We're going to talk about Lido's dominance. We're also going to talk about uh, whether or not Ethereum is better or worse because it has a respected and visionary thought leader, Vitalik, of course. Uh, takes of the week and what Ryan and I are bullish on. Uh, and then we got a song a day from Song a Day Man. And we will get started with all of that stuff as soon as we talk to some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible. Immutable is at the forefront of Web3 gaming on a mission to bring digital ownership to every player, offering the world's best games and game development platform. Immutable lets game builders and players focus on great gaming experiences. So build your next Web3 game on easy mode with Immutable's leading full stack Web3 gaming platform. Its built-in UX features like the Immutable Passport are designed for games to scale to the next billion players coming to Web3. With Immutable, players can sign up with an email, pay with a credit card, and experience a frictionless purchase flow inside of games. So discover your next favorite game and explore a network of 150 games building on Immutable, including such titles as Gaza Chain, Guilds of Guardians, Illuvium, Ember Sword, and Metalcore. So join Web3's largest ecosystem of games and players. Build, play, and connect at immutable.com. Hiring people worldwide, paying them in crypto, providing them access to benefits, it all so complex. But it doesn't have to be. Complying with labor laws, payroll rules, tax obligations, and crypto regulations in every country that you employ someone is difficult, time-consuming, manual, and costly. And it's drawing more and more attention from regulators and governments. But there is good news. Toku is here. Toku is the first employment and compensation platform for the crypto industry that makes this easy. Toku helps you hire employees or contractors and pay them in fiat or crypto legally, compliantly, and with all the taxes handled in over a hundred different jurisdictions. So whether you're an early stage company with just a team of two or you're an enterprise with 200, Toku has a solution that meets your needs. Toku is already working with the leading companies in the space. Protocol Labs, Hedera, Gitcoin, and many more. So transform your employment employment and token payroll operations with Toku. You can reach out to Toku at toku.com slash bankless or click the link in the show notes. Questions from the nation today. Of course, these are asked in the bankless discord, which is available to all bankless citizens. Uh, here's the question. Given Lido's dominance and staking share and clear intentions not to self-limit their shares, Rocket Pools DAO did, would it be possible for the Ethereum Foundation to implement a cap on the maximum share any protocol can control? While not ideal, would it be possible to implement a protocol upgrade as a last resort to protect the network from majority control? 
Blue Furball asks this question. Uh, David, what do you think? So there, there's two parts of this question that I think are worth pulling out. Would it be possible for the Ethereum Foundation to implement a cap? And then is that cap even possible at all? Uh, so EIPs come from many different places. Um, whether or not the, the Ethereum Foundation has deemed it appropriate to actually push and promote an EIP, I don't, that, that is, it, EIPs are discovered more emergently. Like the Ethereum Foundation didn't push 4844. Um, Dankrad and Proto Lambda, uh, who's now on Optimism, these people came up with uh, Dank, the, for, uh, Dank sharding and then pushed that. So like, I'll just throw an objection to the idea that the Ethereum Foundation is implementing I would say a they cap. can. I mean, you have to get like uh, client devs on board right. as well. I mean, you guess it can, it's outside it can of the come Ethereum from Foundation. EF researchers. So if like Dankrad and Justin Drake came to consensus about an EIP, then yeah, that came from the EF. But it they really are came influential. Out from, yes, and they are in the EF. So like semantics here. Um, but the bigger question is like, can we implement a cap? And that answer is no, we cannot, yeah. because the Ethereum beacon chain does not actually know what is an entity and what is a solo staker. It doesn't have information about who is what. And so uh, that is a subjective thing. That is something external to the protocol. So it's not actually possible. How, how would you determine who's got what ether where? The Ethereum protocol is not aware of that fact. Uh, and so um, there's no way to actually enforce decentralization at, at the protocol layer. That is a, that is a, that's part of the layer zero. So I think um, there was actually discussion this week, a lot of discussion on Lido this week, yeah. um, you know, and some concern about the, the share of the market. It's right. over 30%. I don't know if okay. it's like 33, 36%, uh, somewhere in that range. it's in the 60%. No, no, no. It's yeah. not that high. Yeah. As part, uh, you know, what, what are you saying? Is it a proportion of total ETH staked? Of liquid staked ether. Of okay. LSD. Liquid yes. staked ether. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. But total ETH staked, it's closer Correct. to the, like, the low 30s. Yeah. Um, and that's what protocol like designers are really uh, mm -hmm. mostly concerned sure. about is the total yeah. proportion here. And if it get, gets over one third, yeah. one third versus two thirds, yeah. you know, like uh, there are different bad things that can possibly happen. Danny Ryan wrote a great post about this mm -hmm. this week, which um, you might refer you to as well. So there's cause to be concerned, but the remedy is on the social layer. Right. I think right now it's basically people saying, hey, um, <laughs> Don't stake with Lido. They right. have too much stake. So th interestingly enough, it's also where the problem arises because Lido is explicitly a monopolistic DAO. They have explicitly stated, no, our goal is to be the staking provider. Are that We will not self-cap because that's antagonistic to our, our, our vision for ourselves, which is to be the most decentralized staking as a service protocol. But don't you think don't you think Ethereum needs to be resistant to that? So so people often compare it to um, Prism, Prismatic, right? right? Yeah. And they say, well, you know, Prism uh, took f you know fantastic steps to sort of self limit their own growth. And there was a time where they were like seventy percent of the Beacon Chain client, right, and mm -hmm. kind of growing. And now they're back down to like what thirty to forty percent. Mm -hmm. What's different though with Prism versus this is there's no profit incentive right. incentive for Prismatic to right. increase in market share. In fact. Right it would only cause more hassle for them. I mean, I remember we talked to Preston Van Loon after, um, and uh, Terrence from uh, Prismatic after the Ethereum finality event, and they were like, thank God there were other clients. <laughs> it's like, it puts the burden yeah. off of us. Yeah, right? Lido Whereas... does not say, thank God there's Rocket Pool. Exactly. Lido looks they... at Rocket Pool and be like, I want your staked ETH. Okay. Give it, put it in my vault. So what do we do about right. this? Is it a problem? What do we do about this? My answer for what we do about this is like level up right. we have to have some staking um competitors that are competitive with lido mm -hmm. and win the old-fashioned way which is a like a competitive tool set right um that people want to stake with mm -hmm. um it's not happened yet which is so maybe that's a bit like hand wavy right um uh, do you have a better answer? Yeah, there's there's plenty of staking as a service DAOs coming on to the scene. Um, so there's competition available. The supply of competition coming into the market is, that's not a problem. <laughs> Many people would like to start a, and are starting staking as a service orgs. Some differentiated, some not. Um, really, the big answer is we need solo stakers. So the there was the um, uh, the rated.network report that came out that there was 6.5% of um, validators on Ethereum are solo stakers, which sounds like a small number, and maybe it is, but remember 6.5% 6, 6 are these like ultimate hardliners who will not compromise the Ethereum till I die 
uh, go down with the ship. These are these type of people. And having, you only need a minority of those to make sure the Ethereum is protected. Um, you, they, there's still the concern of like anything above 30% is bad. The Lido apologists will say, well, Lido itself is a decentralized org. It wants to be decentralized even more than it already is. Um, and it's the, taking steps to be fair. It's taking steps, yes. Uh, then and then the other Lido, the further Lido apologists will just point at Rocket Pool and say, hey, that community that w the Rocket Pool just wants is mad at Lido because <laughs> Rocket Pool wants that ether not too because they're in second place. Because they're yeah. in second place, right? right. Yeah. Um, granted, the culture around Rocket Pool is healthier for Ethereum. So if Li if Rocket Pool had more and Lido had less, I would say that that would be objectively better for Ethereum. But you also have to be aware of the of the incentives for Rocket Pool in that community. Everyone wants to take down Lido. Um, ultimately, uh, uh, is the layer zero that is going to be the thing that protects Ethereum. Uh, and so this is why anytime Lido shifts into having too much control, you're going to get just like natural pushback from a nebulous set of participants with their own individual incentives. Um, I will say, like, going back to my first point, though, making solo staking easier is going to always that's be the best, the best answer. Thing. Yeah, there's always so the best answer. much work to do with making. And that's really what the EF should be doing is making GUIs for solo stakers. GUIs. Uh, so like if you have to, as a solo staker, touch the command line, that's bad and that's we should scary. not have that. <laughs> and we should fix yeah. that. And that's gonna be a much better solution. I, I, I think so too, I, I think so too. But the layer zero is trying all sorts of things, including yes. shame, right? Shame, Which is a, yeah, shame, a Layer shame. zero strategy. Lido, right? stop I get it. being so monopolistic. Well, it's shame. shaming Lido, but also shaming people who stick with Lido. And yes, that, also is, that. Yeah. that is a stick that layer right. zero can use. I just, right. we got to have better stick. We got to have better carrots and sticks than that. Do um, we own any staked ETH at Bankless? Or do we only uh, own our ETH? We don't uh, own any our ETH, but we run many You're talking pools. about Lido staked ETH? Lido staked yeah, ETH, yeah. Don't, uh -huh. We don't own it right. at Bankless. But we do um, run we do run Rocket Pool mini pools. Yes. Um, oh, are you trying to virtue signal? Yes. I'm <laughs> <laughs> David just slipped slip that in there. Yes. Just we're, we're doing we're doing our part. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, here's a question from uh, Kanas. Kanas. Here's a question from Kanas. What effect do you think it has on the evolution of specific of a specific chain? The fact that Ethereum has a clear, respected, and visionary thought leader, Vitalik, of course, compared to Bitcoin, that has none really. What do you think about that? So. Satoshi did the white paper thing. Right. He's there for a little bit. He participated on various internet forums and then disappeared. Right. Uh, Vitalik, he founded this thing, created the white paper, uh, has not disappeared, has been active in shepherding this. Mm -hmm. I, I think in a, a decentralized leader mm -hmm. type of way. So it's very different from the model of a, a CEO. But still, he has not abandoned the project. He's been working on it. Even though most of the other Ethereum co-founders did sort of abandon right. Ethereum in the early Very days. Very quickly, yeah. And uh -huh. I didn't honestly know what Vitalik would do, whether he right. would kind of stick with it or, or whether he'd do the Satoshi thing. Anyway, right. the question is, what effect do you think this has had on Ethereum? I am grateful that Vitalik uh, is the leader that he is. The, the Bitcoiners will point to Vitalik and be like, look how centralized Ethereum is, whatever Vitalik says goes. Um, to some degree, like whatever Vitalik says goes isn't wrong. But it's not in the way that they're saying it is. They're saying like, yeah, like Vitalik is this dictator of Ethereum. It's like his way or the highway. The only things that Vitalik feels strongly about are like the right things to feel strongly. He's just right. <laughs> He's like the right leader. Uh, and I say that as, uh, as somebody who's like, you, 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 know. you follow Vitalik more like you might follow like uh, Gandhi, for instance. It's not like top down. It's more <laughs> the like- The Bitcoiners are going to love that one. <laughs> you know what I mean? But seriously though, right. there, uh -huh. there's an element of like, there's he's some spiritual it. leadership here. He's earned it, though. Right, right. and, he's, and he's, his track record is proven. Now, as somebody who spent the last two months with Vitalik and Zuzalu and Montenegro, I can tell you he's doing many other things that are not Ethereum. <laughs> uh, and so he is a leader of, of across industries, across uh, technologies. Uh, and so like Ethereum is not, the guy's- It's not a, his full-time job the anymore. The guy's a guy. Like he's not the leader of Ethereum, he's Vitalik. Also, he has philosophical directions for about how Ethereum should be developed and stuff. But yeah, he's doing, he's living a life and some of it happens to be concerned about Ethereum and other things he's concerned about like network states and longevity and public goods. So uh, well, like, 
I mean, yeah. the question of has this had an effect on Ethereum? Undoubtedly so. In yes. fact, I would I would say Ethereum would not be where it is yeah. if the right. leader kind of um, abandoned it. Not abandoned it, but just right. um, went, you know, MIA after the white paper or mm -hmm. after Ethereum 1.0, right? It, it really needed some shepherding leadership. And I'm kind of reminded, you know, I'm a sucker for like founding, you know, America type of right. Uh, things, right? Founding fathers, after they wrote the constitution, they didn't just like yeet out of there, right? Right. I mean, they were still, um, even Washington won the Revolutionary War, served as president for a period of time. Mm -hmm. um, the country kind of needed that. There were right. a lot of questions that right. the original constitution didn't s solve. And so you needed a bill of rights and you, so you right. needed to hash things out in like the Federalist Papers and all of these things. If the, if the founders of the United States just right. left after the right. first white paper right. of America was sh shipped, uh, this would have been a complete mess. It took yeah. some time to sort all these things out. And I think the same is happening with Ethereum. It's more complicated than Bitcoin yeah. too. Yeah, right. Bitcoin had the luxury of being simple enough where the founder could just leave and be, it'd be okay. Ethereum was not that. It, and is not that and needed that guidance from the people who are philosophically and ideologically aligned from I Bitcoin. still think I still think Bitcoin needs it too <laughs> well that's a different story um, <laughs> uh, the uh, the best leadership that I see Vitalik doing and the, the, that I know actually works is when he writes articles titled legitimacy on his blog post and that that article becomes cited in startups reasons for existing I've hmm. seen the Vitalik legitimacy post cited in like decks more than most uh, other like articles that I've read. Uh, yeah. and, and that's just leading, uh, leading in this very like passive, like low touch way that still steers an entire ecosystem. Um, yeah. 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 I don't know if we I, answered the question, but I think we gave, we had, gave the content <laughs> that the, the question well, asked for. Well, asked for. yes, Vitalik uh, <laughs> was necessary. Yes, it massively yes. influenced Ethereum. No, it wouldn't have gotten here without a Vitalik or someone like him. Yeah. And I do think he is actually a fairly unique uh, type of leader in, in history. Yes. Uh, a lot of leaders kind of grab power and uh, they tend to keep it. And he's right. gone in the other direction. Vitalik right. is much less necessary for Ethereum to succeed today than he was five years ago. In fact... Right. I think at this point, if Vitalik left, Ethereum would be totally, totally fine. fine. That, that would have been true a, a number of years ago. Whenever yes. I, the, the last few times I've introduced Vitalik on the podcast, I've introduced him as Vitalik, the guy with, that holds the record for the most ignored EIPs, proposed <laughs> EIPs. And it's true. Really, I think most of his some... EIPs are ignored. Huh. That's interesting. I, like, we should delve into the ignored ones. Maybe there's some good ideas there. That is some <laughs> niche content. So I don't know. Yeah, I not it. understand it. All yeah. right, let's get to some takes of the week. We got yeah. one uh, big one from Kobe. So Kobe, on opportunity, how, how do you win during the bear market, David? What do you do? Mm -hmm. This is the, the season that we're in. We've called it kind of the apathy market. Kobe had some advice, and I think he said this. Uh, sometime in maybe in 2021? the bull market, in the bull market yeah, at the right? peak. Yeah. So when everyone was drunk and look at this pot, these podcast participants, <laughs> do you recognize some of these faces here? Uh, Van Spencer, Suzu. Uh, I don't know who the others are. Okay. Like some, some bull market, uh, content people. Yes, anyway, this, let's, is, let's... this is pre pre this is yeah, it's pre the three hours capital demise. Let's play the, play the clip. What do you think the majority of people that don't make it are the people that lose interest between bull markets like people that have known about it from from so far back who still haven't made it it's because they as soon as it gets frothy it gets to the bull market they they rebuy the all-time high breakout so they rebought at like 20k and they play the bull market they like they're a little bit naturally bearish and the bear market hits and they stay interested for about a year hmm. and then towards the, the tail end like late 2018 2019, they just naturally lose interest and they go, oh, this, this shit's over. I've got life commitments, whatever. And then they get back involved when it starts getting frothy again. And those are the people that are not going to make it. So if you, if there is one piece of advice that I can give is like, find a way to remain the same level of interest that you have now, when you check the chart every day, you like lose sleep over your positions, whatever the fuck you're doing, you over leveraged apes, like you need to have the same level of interest when everything's really boring. Cause right now it's like, everyone's interested, right? Like my, uh, my like parents are like super in like, what shall I buy? My friends from school way back when are hitting me up saying is Cardano good and, and, <laughs> and whatever. But 
none of those people are interested in the in the bottom. None of those people are interested when it's going sideways for six months. And if you tell those people at the bottom in the six months sideways, now's the time, they fucking ignore you. They're like, nah, it seems a bit risky. Like, I, it's not for me. I'll look at it later. And then they hit you up in January of this year. Like, is it too late to get in, by the way? And you're like, no, just immediately market buy. It's like 25K or something. It's 30K. And they're like, mm, I'm going to wait for a dip. And at 60K, they're like, is it too late to market buy, like you said? And you're like, bro, I have no advice for you anymore. I told you at 4K to buy. I told you at like 6K to buy. I told you at 7K to buy. So the, way, the main way you have to make it is try and perpetuate your interest through the boring bit. The boring bit is where the opportunity is when all these moon boys and all the marketers and all the LARPers, they disappear from Twitter and they don't, they don't participate anymore. Their accounts just stop tweeting. That's the bit where you're supposed to be interested and you're supposed to be taking your like next three years of positions. Um, most people that don't make it, they just they stick around for the fun bit. That's it. Stick around for the boring bit. There it is, David. Yep. So try to maintain your interest during the boring bit. This is the boring bit. Let, let me ask you, uh, how do you maintain your interest and how have you done it in previous bore markets? Yeah, the in 2019 was the last bore, bore market that we had. The, it's when I was... Feel, felt like I was taking crazy pills, man. It's like Uniswap got invented. Dye was growing like crazy. Compound was being utilized and no one was talking about it. And the, the advice that I have is like, there is going to be similarly exciting uh, innovations that are granted going to be more complex because we're one more cycle, more mature, but there's going to be things that excite you that you're looking around and you're no one else is getting excited. And you're like, why the F not? Now, if you're good at this game, if you're a good investor, if you're good at playing the crypto crypto world, you will understand, and if you've identified it correctly, you'll understand that that's alpha and you're not taking crazy pills. I felt like I was taking crazy pills for a whole entire year, uh, if not longer. Um, but that, that this is where you have to understand like, no, you're the smart one. You are paying attention when other people are not. Uh, and the looking for alpha is actually easier uh, so long as you understand that, like, yes, people aren't going to be excited about this thing for maybe a frustratingly long amount of time. But so long as you see the vision and you have identified a opportunity, uh, that this this is the year to do it. And we were talking about like the bore market incoming at the at the end of 2022. It's like first we had the we're punched in the face bear market, and now we're having the bull market. And here we are, we've arrived. And so now it's a matter of like, hey, this is where you actually make millions of dollars next bull market if you identify the opportunities. You have like to, in so. order to do this though. Okay, so I think Kobe's advice is so salient around um, do whatever it takes to stay interested, right? right. Okay, so realize that during the um, bull market, your brain was actually rewired for dopamine hits. Yeah. Every time you checked price right. uh, on your phone, your app, and the price went up, boom, dopamine hit. Where's it going to go next, right? Oh, it's down a little bit, but boom, big, big you know, increase again. And you're looking at your net worth and you're like, wow, this is amazing, isn't it? So Every got, time I refresh, it goes up. You got hooked on the dopamine. So you consumed all this crypto content. Now that dopamine is all gone, all right? right? So you have to get your hit. Like your brain wants chemical hits from something and right. you have to get it from something else, all right? Where you can get it, at least uh, for me, it's been doing stuff. Yeah. building something, right. learning about something, trying a new DeFi protocol, trying a new wallet, like learning about uh, ZK machine learning or some sort of obscure, uh, you know, um, obscure topic, and then maybe making content about it. Um, if you're, if you have dev skills and you know, obviously you build something, right? If you don't have dev skills, if you have other kind of softer skills, then you're writing, you're, you're, um, you're, you know, researching you're doing all sorts of things to keep yourself busy and you have to get the chemical hit that way instead um so you have to really rewire your brain and i think if you stay here and if you can maintain your interest then as david you just said like there's benefit on the other side of that but you have to sort of trick your brain into it right. because you've been addicted to the dopamine price hits is no longer present anymore. You got to get it from somewhere else. You know, you know what's a, a great source of dopamine, Ryan? What's that? Is when all of the things that you thought were true come true and turns into a million dollars because you stuck it out through the bear market. That's a nice source of dopamine. Yeah, but it's not instant, is it? It takes no. some time. And uh, for, anyway. For, it take, first takes the crazy pill section. You feel, have to feel like you're taking crazy pills. Yep. And that's how you know you're onto something. That's where we are. Um, all right. What else we got? Another take of the week. What's this is yours. 
Uh, yeah, this is this is me. Uh, so uh, here's my take. Actually, not a take. It's a question. Do okay. y'all think that I can get Ryan to sign up for another <laughs> weekly show? And so here's my oh idea my for the show. Thir- 35 minutes long on Wednesdays, five minutes for the intro. Uh, and then we talk about what we're going to talk about. And then 15 minutes, I teach you about something. And then another 15 minutes, you teach me about something. That's the like show. anything. It's just... Yeah not crypto just you come and you teach me something and i, I teach would imagine you something. that the listeners would enjoy it if it were to be about crypto because we did just talk about figuring out ways to say interested in crypto during the bull market <laughs> uh, but there is no requirement that it is about crypto yes correct are you, you, you trying to get like is this a um, a side way to get the uh, the food podcast in here you're going to come with like you know, nutrition lessons hey, every, every world week? war ii podcast i don't know oh my it, God. Could, could be anything <laughs> uh yeah i mean look it's the hardest thing for me is just finding time to do recording, <laughs> David, as you know. I'm Life saying is very we, busy. Ca- we carve out the time and anyone else who needs a meeting in that time can F off. Really? So we just mm-hmm. carve out dedicated time every we week to do this. We just carve out dedicated time for another, stop another doing, show. Stop yeah. doing it in meetings. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, one question I would have for the Bankless Nation is, would they be interested in this? Uh, for me, one thing that, that gives me the dopamine hits is um, when we get feedback from these shows, right. when people are actually interested, when uh, we get like viewers on our shows, and when I like hear feedback that hey, like great episode, you, you yeah. know, product market fit, product yeah. market fit, that's the kind of thing. So a signal for this would be if we heard from backlist listeners that this kind of show format was interesting. Maybe they get too much content from us already, David. I don't know, man. Don't we do like three to four podcasts a week, every single freaking week, and we're talking about adding another one here. I remember when, uh, let's see, it was the weekly roll up, which was the third show that we layered on. First, we did the Monday podcast, and they were like, then I was like, Ryan, we need to do a weekly like news show to cover this event that's happening. So we layered on State of the Nation, and then I was like, Ryan, we're only covering one weekly news thing. We need to recover the entire week news. So let's do the weekly roll up. But that was like two years ago. We've been doing these three podcasts for like two years that's now. True. That's I true. think it's time for another podcast. And I think uh, if you pull up this tweet that I just sent you in Zoom, ETH Wave, put it nicely, David learns something. Ryan learned something and I learned two things. Sounds like a good deal to me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, I want to hear what the Bankless Nation thinks. Let me mull that over, David. I can't, cool. uh, I can't give you an answer can't, on the spot. Can't commit. You know. can't commit. No, I can't All commit right. on the spot. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm naturally breaks anyway. But mm-hmm. I will say, to your credit, I did think that the podcast was a bad idea in the beginning. <laughs> I did also think that adding the weekly roll-up was a bad idea. And uh, weekly roll-up has become like the cornerstone my, of this podcast. It's been my favorite. It's, I enjoy it. Like yeah. this, this gives me energy. Sometimes it's hard right. to kind of get your head around all the topics, but uh, I enjoy yeah. these little chats we have. So mm-hmm. um, I don't want to discount this. Tell me what you're bullish on this week, though, my friend. So I know we just came out of, uh, hey, how do you maintain uh, interest during the bore market? My strategy is to invest time and energy into something completely different so that when you do have time for crypto, you make it in very intentional and you go very deep rather than just getting like scrolling through crypto Twitter. So you don't Anyways, have to talk about the meme coins if you don't want to, that kind of yes, thing. Yes, exactly. You're, you're, free, you're free to ignore what you consider noise and just tap into intentional stuff. Anyways, uh, so I'm bullish on climbing mountains. <laughs> what? Completely, actual, un- completely unrelated. Actual yeah, mountains. So actual actual not mountains. Outside the metaverse yeah. mountains. <laughs> so uh, in one month time, uh, you'll be doing two weekly roll-ups with Anthony Sazano. Oh, my God. Because I will be in the middle of uh, uh, mountains in Washington, Mount Rainier and Mount Baker. And then at the end of ETH CC, I've signed up to climb the Matterhorn, which, by the way, is verifiably insane thing to do to sign up to climb the Matterhorn while having done zero mountains before, which is why I have to climb like, two other insane, mountains. Like, insane, also dangerous, question mark? Uh, on the risk spectrum, yes, I would say. Yeah, it, everything's on the risk spectrum. How uh-huh. far on the risk spectrum is this? Um, Everest. Uh, like that's... Much so. Everest is twenty six thousand feet. The Matterhorn is fifteen thousand feet. Okay. Just judging a mountain by feet is you can't do that. A right? very Im- imprecise picture. Uh, I mean, look People... at look at look at how fucking steep that thing is, dude. <laughs> I mean, are you, you see, sure? You see the ridge that is on the on the right side. I don't want to do this podcast solo, David. Yeah, I know. Well, not only is it uh, your co-host, but it's also uh, a very in- integral member of the Bankless uh, team as well. So it's two of us. So, hey, you know, if we both go down, like, you, know, you might as well just fold the thing. Oh, my God. <laughs> wow. That's just, this is great. This is great news. I'm excited yeah. for you. So, so um, what kind of training goes into this? Uh, I've been going to the gym twice a day for the past week or so, ever since I got back from... Uh, 
uh, just start now. Just start in that training. Uh, well, I was, I was running around in Montenegro. Now I have 50 pounds on my backpack on a stair stepper, which, let me tell you, is extremely boring. My God, though. Makes well, crypto can, very interesting. You can listen well, to some podcasts while you do I, it, though, That's right? exactly what I did. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, um, this looks crazy. Uh, I would never attempt something um, like this, and I'm also proud of you. Uh, but also, uh, Hold on. I, be don't careful. be proud of me. I haven't done it yet. Okay, but just even trying to attempt this uh, is crazy. Um, well, we'll see if I can actually get it halfway up the mountain. But oh that's, what, that's what I'm very, very excited about. All right, I don't well, know how to get exposure to mountains, but if I could, I would. No boar market for David. He's going to climb the matter, uh, Matterhorn. The Matterhorn, yeah. That's uh-huh. incredible, man. Right, what are you bullish on, Ryan? It's nothing nearly as exciting. <laughs> it's something about crypto. Is that okay? <laughs> Wait, what? It's uh, restaking. Uh, yeah. So we did this episode with uh, Sri Ram, who mm-hmm. is kind of the father of restaking. Um, he's the founder of this protocol called Eigenlayer. We recorded that earlier this week. It comes out mm-hmm. on Monday. Mm-hmm. Um, got me really excited about restaking, at least excited um probably 80 percent excited 20 percent concerned Word. yeah which is which is always the most interesting type of pod- podcast and i feel like restaking will either hit product market fit and it'll be absolutely massive or it won't right, right. Um, but if it does it'll be a really big deal so this to me restaking is potentially as big as layer twos were for scaling decentralization Okay. And yeah. it's as big as MEV was in terms of the challenges presented to the protocol and protocol research. It really changes the incentive game. And to me, it's as big as maybe the merge or something like it for the value of ETH, the asset. So you combine all of these things and man, um, restaking is like this massive rabbit hole that I feel like we'll be journeying on, uh, not just now, but in the years to come. That again is if it hits if it achieves product market fit. And I think there's more than a fair chance it will. So this is something I think that you want to know, learn about Ethereum and you want to know about crypto. This is probably the, the newest frontier right. to go explore. So I anticipate yes. this first episode will be one of many that we actually do on restaking. In fact, we're talking about doing a panel with um, Sri Ram and, and some of the protocol researchers as well and, you know, and um, talking about this further. So I'm bullish on it, but like scared bullish on restaking <laughs> is what I would say. Maybe the same way you're bullish about climbing the Matterhorn. <laughs> I, at least right. I hope you're a little like if cautiously you're not a little fearful. Bit scared, you're not. You're doing something wrong. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh-huh. I feel the same, right. except from yeah. the comfort of my home. Uh, yes. So I, <laughs> <laughs> the scariness can stay inside of the computer. Yeah. yeah. The the investable surface area around restaking is significant. I mean, it's been it's as large as layer two, like you said. So. It's gonna change the game. Gonna change the yeah, game, I think. Very much. Um, thank you for thank you for making this section about crypto. Yeah, yeah. You're you're welcome. Uh, meme of the week. We have no meme of the week, but we do have something special for you guys. Uh, and this is um, a moment of Zen song. So, um, full disclosure ahead. Uh, a lot of language in the next song here that you're about to hear. I think it's worth it because uh, it's it like it's exactly how I feel. Like we've got to stop sending our money to randos on the internet who are just going to scam us. Um, I feel justified in playing this song. This is a song by Song Day Man uh, mm-hmm. that we're Man. about to hear. Yeah. So let's let's play that. Um, I'm gonna get to risks and disclaimers and then stick around for that. Of course, gotta let you know none of this has been financial advice. Crypto is risky. You could lose what you put in, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot. Stop sending fucking money, randomly to asshole. Stop sending fucking money, randomly to asshole. Stop sending fucking money, random fucking money. Stop sending fucking money, random fucking money. People say crypto is a scam and we all put them right. Or the shadow part of money is not just out in the light. Either way, I'm disappointed and I'm feeling fucking sick.
fucking money, ran a mean your asshole. Stop sending fucking money, you're fucking money. Stop sending fucking money, you're fucking money.